three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And I hope I'm live. Let's check it on YouTube. Uh, it sounds I am here. So hello, everyone, in this webinar uh, for .NET GC about, I, I mean, .NET GC for absolute beginners. I'm super happy you are here. Just give me any kind of feedback, well, whether do you hear me well or not. Uh, I hope so everything is working and Facebook will not be that like previous weeks when we had a conference and there was an outage of this platform when we broadcast because the Facebook had that outage. So I hope everything will be working well today. Uh, so if you are here, just say hello, say from where you are, um, and just give us, give me any kind of feedback like I was on the conference and I was talking to you in front of you, not talking to camera, unfortunately, but that's the times we are living. So um, just, as I said, say hello and uh, we will be proceeding. Uh, First of all, um, I see the very first question. Yes, it will be report, uh, recorded. So the same link will be later on available with the same thing. So if you don't have time now, for example, uh, or maybe not fully time, for, you can dedicate to this webinar. You can watch it later on. Although I invite you to be here live because then you have a question, uh, possibility to ask questions and interaction with me and with other people so uh, just try to stay with me for this one hour uh, so uh, hello from poland hello from uk from uh, united states and from spain and from brazil and from philadelphia united states so from a lot of places i'm super happy you are here because i really like topic of .NET GC. If you know me, probably you know that. If you don't know me, you will see that. And uh, I would like to talk a lot about .NET GC today from a little different perspective. Hello from Romania. Hello from Germany. I was in Romania before the pan pandemic times in Cluj. It was really nice uh, opportunity to, to visit your country and get, give a talk at the conference in there okay so uh, and hello from india i was not in india yet <laughs> and in peru too so i hope there are dot net conferences in peru and i will be able to give a talk there okay so today today's talk is about dot net gc from a little bit different perspective so and um, if you know me or maybe not, uh, I'm talking a lot about advanced stuff sometimes about, uh, you know, how you can use even even how you can use pointers in .NET, what is span and in various caveats and edge cases. But uh, also I publish a lot of things about .NET, but pretty often there are some questions like, OK, but what it is all about? What is .NET GC? Uh, what are the generations and so on? So I thought, OK, I probably didn't do the basic thing. Like I haven't done any kind of introduction about .NET GC from really, really basic stuff and point of view. So this is the webinar about it. Uh, although it doesn't mean it will be trivial, like uh, even basic stuff may be presented, uh, let's say, from interesting point of view. So I hope it will be. Uh, just a few words about me. So I'm a .NET developer, simply kind of freelance, freelancer, trainer, consultant, speaker. I, lot, I tweet a lot. I wrote this book about Pro.NET memory management. I'm a co-founder of .NETOS initiative. So if you like learning uh, in .NET, then you can go and visit our site. We have various courses and other stuff about, and also a lot of free content about .NET and interesting various, you know, advanced stuff that you can learn about it. And uh, if you like, if you like this for this webinar, for example, you can visit my Twitter. I'm mostly active on Twitter. So if you don't have any Twitter account, I invite you to create just one for me, <laughs> just to follow me and a lot of other really, really smart people that are there. So uh, 
that's a super nice source of and the main social media for dotnet developers i would say that's my perception uh okay uh so as i said a lot of content is presented by me on online like uh, i had this series about the did you know something about gc and memory in dotnet uh, and they are pretty advanced stuff sometimes like you, you in skipping initialization of local variables or how the specific byte array is implemented underneath and so on and so on and as i said that's super nice but i believe some introduction will be also really nice so here we are and uh, i present a lot of other stuff uh, mostly about memory management in general so for example if you will be willing to learn more about how dotnet gc is implemented i created this series on youtube it is uh, 10 episodes and over 14 around uh, around 14 hours of material deep dive how dotnet is implemented this is not super practical like there is a lot of stuff that is just for description how it is implemented because it is super interesting uh, amount of knowledge but you may find it interesting so here it is there is a playlist uh, you can find me on uh, youtube and find dot netos on youtube simply and you will find this series uh, about implementation details this webinar is about something totally different totally opposite like not how it is implemented but maybe in some parts but what it is in the end and the very first thing is feel free to ask questions and discuss you i'm here for you today so just don't hesitate to uh, interrupt me i will try to uh, to to make it kind of i would like to see it as a interactive webinar so i can i will be watching questions all the time and trying to answer as they are asked so let's make it kind of interaction and uh, discussion not only my my lecture <clears throat> showing you some things um and yes there is an apple event today uh that's unfortunate i was asking them to make it later but unfortunately they <laughs> they haven't agreed so uh, there is a con concurrent uh, event happening now showing some apple gadgets unfortunately but i hope you will be watching me and if you are watching the recording because you are watching there I'm happy that you are even watching me later on. So uh, I've, I'm seeing the very first question. Uh, when do we need to implement I disposable? Very nice question. We will come to, I will remember that question and we will come to that. Regarding slides, that's the main slide. Like I don't have any super prepared slides for today. I just wanted to make it more experimental and uh, let's say, um, hand driven uh, so i have some uh, things to show but with not not so many uh, slides to present you so uh, what i prepared is a mind map because i really like preparing mind maps when i'm learning stuff and trying to summarize stuff and by the way all the time i'm preparing some mind maps when i when i'm doing course about something i'm preparing mind maps to have a overall picture how it and what i should and what i would like to present so here here we have a example mind map about dotnet gc4 today uh, it looks pretty funny because it is, has only two arms but uh, it is enough for today uh, so um, sorry i will be sometimes reading the chat and i can't speak and read at the same time so some s short pauses will be will be happening um yes uh, yes exactly knowledge is more important than entertainment so apple no no i ag i agree like we can <laughs> because we learn we can buy nice gadgets from apple so first knowledge and then fun okay so dotnet gc uh 
This is super, super, super beginning, beginner stuff. So I will be talking about things that some of you may know or at least have heard at least once. But when, when, it, when you are reading about .NET GC many times, you will see uh, a description in a presented in a way that is not totally satisfying me personally because you will see something about server GC or maybe about generations or maybe about something else or allocations but I haven't met any particular tutorial webinar article that will try to present it in a high level point of view from various really important features characteristic characteristics and that's why I'm trying to do it and how I'm trying to do it today. So they are here and I have seven of, seven of them, uh, features of .NET GC. So first of all, it is a multi-platform thing. So uh, .NET is multi-platform. Uh, obviously, it was started as mostly Windows-based thing, but currently we have .NET Core, which is called .NET 5.6. And it is multi-platform, so it is supporting Mac OS, Linux, Windows, and ARM software, ARM hardware, and so on. So, all because the runtime is multi-platform, .NET GC is also as a part of the runtime multi-platform, uh, and it is coming with the runtime itself. Which means uh, the, the very first question may be whether there are big differences between Linux, for example, and Windows version. So the answer is no. Uh, and just to make it clear, the answer is no, because maybe it was not said in clearly enough. There are really small differences between uh, various implementation uh, between Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. Most of the code is exactly the same. There is only small part uh, on the low level of the runtime itself how the how the runtime and the GC is talking with the operating system, but the whole algorithm is exactly the same. So that would be the very first thing that I would like to uh, make clear. Although uh, there is a, um, there is a thing that we have various runtimes. So we have, for example, the, the main, let's say, family of runtimes, which is .NET Framework, .NET Core, .NET 5.6, and so on. And they are sharing the same implementation of the GC. There are some very little differences currently. Uh, sometimes some changes from .NET Core are backported to .NET Framework. And we can say that 80, 90, 9% of uh, the, the thing here is the same. And when you are using those frameworks, most of the things are uh, applicable for, for all those runtimes. We have Mono, which is a different story, but pretty important runtime also owned by Microsoft currently. And uh, it is important because it is running pretty important stuff like Xamarin, Unity Game Engine, and Blazor WebAssembly. So pretty important thing that Microsoft is talking about a lot and they are all running on mono so it is a different runtime and it has totally different GC like conceptually it is pretty the same but uh, they have big differences so mostly when talking about .NET GC uh, we are thinking about those main runtimes and not the mono one it has some different characteristics let's say and uh, I'm not covering it today and I'm mostly not covering it anywhere like when i'm talking about dotnet gc uh, mono is a different story so i probably should make a different webinar about the mono gc and so on then there we have a, those pretty small runtimes let's say small like nano framework recently getting popularity there was i i believe rest in peace dotnet compact framework and many other smaller ones mostly sharing mostly with some dedicated really small simple gc so this is a different story we are not covering it today also because th those are pretty exotic things and not so important for mo most of us okay uh, let's look at chat we have two questions about finalize finalizers and i disposable so that will be covered and uh, this 
allocation happens so we we'll do, do um, allocations okay i will also come come to allocations so i remember about your questions and let's move on <clears throat> So that's the very first high high level thing that I would point out. It is multi-platform and it is the same for most of our applications. There are some differences. Obviously, I don't have enough time here to cover all. And especially in .NET 6, we will be seeing more and more differences between .NET 6 and the previous runtimes. There are some various experimental things being added. <clears throat> so we can expect a growing gap between .NET 6 and the uh, .NET framework, for example. Currently, it is pretty, pretty the same. Another super important high-level thing is that we have it per process, because sometimes I see that people are a little bit confused about that. So, um, so per process means that if you have multiple .NET applications running on your machine, every .NET process is its own has its own .NET runtime, has its own GC, has totally separate management of the memory. So they don't see each other. And if one of the application has the GC triggered, on other ones may not have the GC triggered. They do not know anything about each other. So there is nothing like machine-wide GC happening in .NET. Uh, although I have heard something like that, uh, that people thought that it happens. No, it doesn't. Like if you have heavily using GC application running on your server because it is heavily processing some user requests, other applications may be not touched by the GC at all because it is a separate thing. And I believe it is really worth to, to make it clear because also, as I mentioned, people are sometimes confused. The question is uh, one that I can immediately answer. The what is the name of you, of the tool you are using for mind maps? It's uh, it's a Xmind tool. So um, I'm not even sure if it is the best because I haven't tested every uh, mind mapping tool on the on on the planet. But I like the I like this tool. It is fine for me. So Xmind is the answer. Okay, uh, so that's the one other thing, and now we have uh, even bigger, even bigger, the third high-level point of view about .NET GC, which is the fact that is pretty often ignored, and I believe it is one of the most, like the most important one, that the GC is driven by uh, the application uh, behavior. So. Like Mani Stevens, which is the .NET uh, GC lead developer in Microsoft, uh, is saying there is a balance between how much work you need to do as a performance or in general as an engineer and how much GC handles automatically. And that's true. But in general, whatever you whatever you want to do, in the end, the GC is driven by the application behavior. So you wrote this this application so it is driven by your application behavior so by your code and that's important to understand uh, especially the thing is that it is not for example uh, driven by time people sometimes think that um you know it is triggered every one second or some every one minute or something like that that's not true uh it has no any like periodical uh, just to reclaim memory it would be unproductive and productivity on, on the other hand will be the most important word when uh, the dotnet gc ne needs to do something the dotnet team developing gc really wants to make gc as productive as possible and it will try to fine tune to your application behavior. And but what I mean by the behavior is mostly allocations. How often you allocate? What do you allocate? And uh, those allocation patterns and uh, in general allocation rates are the mo one of the most important things that will, first of all, trigger GC. And uh, secondly, 
everything will be fine-tuned to that because how often we allocate will also uh, as a consequence we will have more and more garbage to collect and gc will have more and more work to do so uh, yes people sometimes when i'm talking about dotnet gc and various things in dotnet memory management they are saying i don't care because it is all automatic and i don't have any control over that and that's not true because dotnet gc is driven by your application behavior and you control the application behavior so uh, if you write a code that does not allocate like a crazy you will influence how often gc is triggered for example or on the other hand if you allocate a, like a crazy you will allocate a lot of uh, you will trigger a lot of gcs and so we can control it by our code and by uh, also, on the other hand, we can control it directly. For example, there are various GC modes that we can switch between uh, to control how the GC is uh, reclaiming memory. There are some additional settings to make GC more aggressive or less aggressive. Uh, so that will be also a thing that we will be talking about a little. Uh, so that's not true that we that it is totally automatic and we don't have any control over that. That's That's not true, period. And uh, okay, and then the next super high level thing is that it is so-called tracing GC. That's uh, another confusion that people are sometimes having and uh, that sometimes have. Uh, it is not based because sometimes someone have heard about reference counting and it thinks that he thinks she thinks that it is used by .NET GC. So no, uh, reference counting is not used by uh, .NET GC, it is a tracing GC, uh, which is a super tremendous consequence about how in general memory management in .NET looks. Uh, so uh, let's say that uh, I will switch to my hand, hand drawing magic skills now using uh, trying to present some uh, example in a graphical way. So imagine that we have a variable uh, x, which is just, uh, we assign a new customer because I was writing about customer in tweet, on Twitter. So let's stay with the customer. So what's, what's in the end happening when, when we write, when the runtime executes our C-sharp code like that? <clears throat> We already know that it is all per process, so we know that in general it is not influenced by other applications on the machine, okay? And we know that uh, it is somehow managed by the GC and uh, that the GC is uh, um, influenced by our code, by behavior of our application, and one of, of, of them is like we see here allocation what is happening here is that the gc needs to create now this object somewhere and this place when it is uh, and this place when it is happening is called managed heap because it is managed by the gc and in the runtime it's uh, in general uh, so the managed heap will be the place when this new object will be created let's draw it like uh, um, this block and we have just created uh, the object in memory in this managed heap and uh, and and we are assigning it to this local refer reference because that's what our code is doing and now we have our object in memory uh, the local variable is pointing to it and that would be the most of the thing uh, we, need, we need to know. Like the allocation has happened. Obviously, our applications are a bit, a bit, a little bit more complex. So our customer will be probably pointing to different objects, like, like I don't know, city, like some information about the company. This information about company may have various. Uh, other objects referenced so there will be the whole object graph when every object will point other objects through their uh, through their 
uh, fields simply because typically it is just a field like first name here may point to a string which is also an object that will be living on the managed heap here we can have a company that is pointing to a name which is also a string so we are building this whole object graph uh, hello from mauritius super nice to to hear that we have someone from uh, mauritius and the question about whether this map is available to everyone it will be available uh under the link i will provide you later on i am going to to, sh to to give you access to this mind map which by the way will be also extended a little bit more than the in the version that i'm showing you today <clears throat> Okay, so uh, I said that the GC is tracing GC and th the tracing GC has this power to answer a super important question. What is no, what is no longer needed? And uh, why something is no longer needed? Obviously, when we stop use this object, like if it is a method, imagine that it is a method called M and it is simply newing up this customer doing it with something like maybe storing to database and then uh, we end this method so uh, the gc will know that this local variable is no longer needed uh, so it will somehow get this knowledge okay we don't need uh, this local variable anymore but it means that we don't have this reference anymore because that was the reference that was kept inside this local variable. And the whole tracing GC is the thing that .NET, that the tracing GC will discover what are the objects that are reachable, so-called reachable objects, what are the objects that are live, uh, so we cannot delete them. Uh, and this is happening because we trace those objects and we to trace those objects we need to stop for example our application for a moment and look around how the object graph looks like and if it is like this imagine that we have ended this method and now we are looking around what is reachable we will see that nothing is reachable because we don't have any local variable here and we don't have any place from which we could start visiting our graph of objects so the whole uh, the, this whole object graph is not reachable and we can get rid of all those objects but if from different method for example there was another variable that is pointing let's say to this object we will know that okay we can get rid we can visit this graph and we can start visiting it from this local variable and we will visit and mark as reachable this object because now okay this one is really needed because someone is using it and that's all and we will not mark we will not visit anything else like this those four objects will be not visited they will be not marked and it means that we have traced this information that okay those objects are not needed why it is important or why i'm talking about it uh, because there is this difference in time between uh, which something is really uh, not needed and after which there is some point in time when we will discover that and only after some time we will do something with it so it is not like okay you could imagine that we are leaving this method and we see that x was a local variable pointing to this customer so just after this line when we are leaving this method we can get rid of a customer because we know that what it was created here no one was pointing to it so we can get rid of it so that's not what is happening in case of tracing gc uh, because tracing gc is working after after some time it will kick in and we we'll be starting to uh, start to look around to see what is really uh, not reachable and what can be deleted so there will be this uh, difference in time and it's important because uh, if we don't have this if you have this situation like here let's uh, just delete those two things and imagine that you are executing this method 
uh, that you are executing this method and uh, you are newing up this customer and you leave this method and the whole other program continues and you make a memory dump, for example, here. So after some time, after this method has ended, you will take a memory dump and then you will, uh, memory dump is just let's say one of the tools that allows you to, ta to take the full picture of what was in memory at a given point in time and you will be you will you might be surprised that you will see in memory dump that those objects are still there because uh, probably it happened that gc was not yet triggered and we simply haven't looked what was uh, used and what should be deleted uh, so there will be this slight delay between something really not needed and something deleted <clears throat> this is called sometimes called like floating gar garbage because we have in memory objects that are not needed uh, but it is not it was really not yet detected so we didn't do anything with that <clears throat> that's why it is important and that's why we also say that uh, tracing GC is non-deterministic because we know that after sometimes memory will be reclaimed, but we really don't know after which time. For sure, there will be some delay before uh, we will be reclaiming memory, and it produces some, you know, memory that in the end could be reclaimed, but it is not at the moment. Uh, so that's important thing, like the thing that it is uh, that .NET GC is tracing, GC produces some um, overhead, let's say, in terms of memory usage, because we don't reclaim it immediately as we could. Uh, by the way, that's the thing, how the tracing GC is working, and iDisposable will not anything here. Uh, so we, if an object has a dispose method calling dispose method doesn't help like from the gc perspective it is just any other regular method so it will be just uh, called at some time by you probably reclaiming uh, releasing some unmanaged resources but from the gc perspective it is as any other method and it doesn't change anything we, we cannot speed up things by calling dispose for example Okay, <clears throat> so we have this situation and uh, that, that's important thing. Another important thing is that, okay, we have discovered that something is, um, let's say, uh, that something is uh, not reachable, so we can get rid of it. And now what we can do with it uh, is another story and uh, there are various techniques how we can get rid of this memory and in case of dotnet we have two we have sweep and compact as a technique for for getting rid of memory so uh, the very first uh, and they can be presented simply like that i will not draw with this because it would just take too much time and the goal is here not to waste time for you show watching as i'm drawing so here here is the example uh, we have this object graph uh, different a little bit different but in general the same concept here uh, we have some objects in memory we have some routes from which we have started visiting our objects they are probably local variables we have visited some objects some were not visited so there are to be deleted because there is no path in our code in by which we can access those two objects and if so we can get rid of them simply so this will happen after so after, after some time and uh, they will be somehow all the visited objects will be somehow marked and we will be uh, now in this full knowledge that we can get rid of object cnf and two uh, two techniques uh, sweeping or compacting Sweeping is simple because we can just tour, turn all the space of no longer needed objects into a free space. And that's the whole story. So it sounds pretty simple and it is simple. 
uh, because now we, instead of those objects we have free space here and here obviously we can group the free space if many of ob of objects lying to next to next to each other will die will create create bigger free space uh, that, uh, that when we will be grouping all these uh, objects after deleting into one continuous region of free space and we will be able to reuse it probably that's good because then we have a new space uh, and when we will be allocating a new object maybe we will be able to fit it inside this or that gap so that would be nice because then we will be simply reusing the free space that we have that we have from var from previous gcs um and uh, that's okay that's one of the one that's one of the techniques the different the second one is compacting so uh, a little bit more complex because then uh, it's like moving bricks next to each other so if you want to get rid of the space from of after object cnf we simply move all the places next to each other so we are getting rid of any space everything is compacted and it results in an optimal memory usage let's say because now we have we are using less memory simply because we can get rid of some memory at the end uh, and that would be really beneficial because we can re return for example some of the memory to the operating system that would not happen in case of sweeping because this memory which we marked here as a free space it's still assigned to our process and that's another that that's let's say um, one of the reasons why i'm talking about that because it might be pretty surprising because many of the gcs in dotnet are sweeping and in the end they are returning some uh, we are treating some space as free space to be reused but uh, we are not uh, giving back this memory to operating system so from the operating system perspective as you look at the memory usage for example in task manager you will see that this memory this process has the same size this all the time uh, it will not return this memory it will be simply keeping it for further allocations and uh, that may be good or not depending on the for example workload of your application what how you how do you process your items uh, and uh, if, if it is a problem for you or not so the fragmentation will be something that you should be aware of and probably for example you can measure fragmentation to know what's your what's fragmentation of your uh, application uh, how the gc is behaving uh, maybe you waste a lot of memory because of fragmentation and that would be the nice things to to be aware of in case of uh, .NET gc <clears throat> so uh, that would be the five fifth uh, high level uh, element that you should be aware of when we are talking about .NET gc <clears throat> sweeping produces fragmentation and does not return memory to the operating system typically so your memory usage will be pretty same even the gc is happening inside it is not reclaiming memory and uh, compacting will be nicer because it compacts things and uh, we can get rid of some memory we can return some memory to the operating system so your process may be smaller in terms of memory usage but it has its own overhead like we need to move those objects so unfortunately it is uh, this cost that we need to take into consideration and dc will in dotnet will have this decision every time whether it wants to compact or maybe just to sweep and in the end you will see bigger or smaller fragmentation or bigger or smaller memory usage depending on uh, those decisions <clears throat> uh okay let's look i see some questions so maybe i will be able to answer it now i have an a software uh i have an a software that inspect images from products in a convey it's cyclic after inspecting the image the software is idle for some millisecond uh should i call gc collect after the inspection 
that would that may be one of the let's say most common use cases for GC collect. Uh, in general, GC collect probably should not be called in your application because it means that this whole story of smart GC that tries to fine tune to your application doesn't work and you need to somehow trigger it manually and that would be not the case probably all the time but if you have such specific points in time that you know that your application is idle but it was processing some memory and it is going to process some memory that would be totally fine to try to at least and experiment with this approach that you can call GC Collect then uh, so they will be you will take uh, uh, advantage of those uh, idle moments of your application although if this is a pretty constant workload like you are doing this every second 10 times per second or so GC probably also will tuned to this uh, behavior. So it is not um, said that for sure it will be beneficial, but I would at least experiment with that uh, in your case, because maybe it will be beneficial. It really depends, um, you know, on the specific workload about what amount of memory turns we are talking here, what is the size of those images. But uh, just to shorten the answer, yes, probably you can experiment with that. It may be uh, uh it may be it may there is a chance it will make sense in this in, in this particular scenario <clears throat> okay uh, moving further uh so we have tracing sweeping compacting and uh those are these things that you should be aware of and now we have the generational aspect which is the big one like those previous ones were important so you know already that for example your code may introduce fragmentation uh, and uh, gc may be producing fragmented memory so you use more memory than needed but the generational aspect is even in more important <laughs> i would say because it is mm, pretty misleading and pretty surprising in various aspects. So uh, why the generational thing is um, is implemented? Uh, in general, what I said previously was like about the whole memory. So when I was talking about, let's say, this graph, or when I was drawing this graph, I was uh, talking about the whole managed heap and that's fine like uh, that would be fine to implement it like that that we have all objects in one big bag that we consider all the time but that's not that would not in the end be an uh, optimal thing and just generational gcs are doing things like they split the managed heap into several spaces in case of dotnet we have three Gen so-called generations so generational aspect uh, will be important uh, as you will see in a moment and in case of dotnet we have three generations which are simply called generation zero one and two uh, which are pretty good names <laughs> easy to um, remember and uh, they are based on so-called generational hypothesis like in general the whole generational thing is based on this finding that most objects die young and only some part of objects are living long so it really makes sense to split them into the for example young objects and old objects and we will be considering old objects pretty rarely because we expect not so often that should die so it doesn't make sense to look at them frequently on the other hand young objects typically die soon so it makes sense to look at them pretty often most of them most of them should die and that makes sense and um, to look at them pretty frequently and so in the end uh, that would what the gc will try to fine tune to uh, and try to tune to this behavior that it will reclaim memory from the generation zero pretty often and it will look at generation two really uh, not so often let's say pretty rarely 
my because it expects most of the objects which should should simply stay there and we should not look there many many times and uh, it has various important consequences like imagine that uh, first of all it optimizes the whole algorithm because now we have various objects in those various generations so we can look at them in various uh, way like for example if we garbage collect only gener generation zero we will traverse only generation zero so we will be visiting this object this object this this and this but we will not go further and here we can have gigabytes of data so we will just get rid of traversing of this huge amount of objects here because simply we don't care like we are doing gen zero and we are looking only at objects in generation zero that's super beneficial because um, we get rid of a lot of work uh, on the other hand uh, there is a super important thing that we should be aware of uh, imagine that you have an object in generation one and it points to an object in generation zero so you have a opposite situation uh, we have some customer here, let's say, that was living long enough to be promoted to this generation one because it is based on promotion. And when an object survives, it will be promoted to older generation. So it may happen that we have some customer instance that has been promoted to generation one. But later on, for example, we assign it to uh, and we change the first name. So the string here that was just created uh, is in generation zero but the customer is in generation one and uh, that's important because if we will be looking at generation zero only and typically we as we said mostly be interested in those younger generations what we can do is we don't know like we have an object in older generation that is making our object alive uh, but we don't need and don't want to traverse this generation to find out whether customer is really alive or not because that would make us to it would force us to traverse the whole graph in the end uh, so what we are doing is that we just assume that it is making our object alive we know about this reference we know that there is a customer in older generation that is keeping our object alive and that's all uh, we are just saying okay this object is alive and uh, unfortunately we are keeping it alive just because there is some older object keeping uh, a reference to this one that's surprising Be this this is has a funny name of nepotism that's problem is called nepotism because uh, it is making some older objects promoting younger objects and uh, if you have many such references from older objects to younger objects they will make them those objects alive and uh, that might be some in some world clothes it may be a problem because uh, as you see this object even doesn't have to be really used it does not have any local viable no one is pointing to it simply it is there because it is in the older generation and we don't do gen 1 we are doing only gen 0 so we will be keeping this object there and promoting into the young for example older generation just because there was one uh, object in the older generation <laughs> so this nepotism problem uh, which is directly connected with the generational aspect of the gc uh, may be sometimes surprising and you will see a lot of objects in memory just because you have some objects in gen 2 for example uh, holding them alive <clears throat> Another important aspect of the generational thing is that if we are doing Gen 0, for example, as I mentioned many times, we are not garbage collecting older generations. So uh, if, as, if we are doing Gen 0, like here, we will discover that those objects are now needed, but those uh, in Gen 1 and Gen 2 will be still alive. 
uh, which is, as uh, Maoni stated, that uh, clearly if you don't do GC at a given generation, we treat those objects which are there as life simply, which is a super important consequence of the generational aspect because we are keeping a lot of objects in memory because simply we don't look at those generations. <laughs> and so it is a pretty surprising thing because now you can have some objects in Gen 2, for example, living for days, for hours, only because we don't do generation 2. So this generational aspect is, is super, super important also uh, to, to, to grasp and uh, that's super short webinar. So unfortunately, I don't have enough time to cover all this, but that would be uh, the problem, one of the problems that you can meet when looking at the GC. <clears throat> uh, let's look at the questions. Uh, first question is is it better to check the fragmentation and memory management as soon as you start creating the app or mostly only when you have some issues uh, that's a very good question so uh, first of all really you should measure uh, that's the very good thing that uh, we are talking about measuring and I would start from like uh, we need to measure for sure I would not measure prematurely if you are doing a startup and you really want to make some software that is really working and providing some value and you validate your idea, probably you should not care about it so much, obviously, because what you need is your, you, you need customers, not the low fragmentation. Uh, but if you are doing the, tar the, the let's say the um, final product and you, no, it will be developing this product and you will be just improving this product and it is an important product for your application, I would start from measuring as soon as possible. It is like easy thing to do and then you will need simply, you will have some history, you will track the regression, you will see what the uh, new deployment is doing with your application. So I definitely um, encourage for measuring as soon as possible if it is your uh, target application let's say it is not a kind of prototype but the, the thing that will be with you for years i would i would measure as soon as as possible uh, you don't need to you know be <clears throat> uh, paralyzed by the results simply to be aware of them uh, so you will know in future whether it, it becomes a problem or not maybe it may you, maybe you can have some quick win by find, by changing GC mode or one of the settings and reduce memory usage. But then you will have the tool at hand how you can change, like how you can measure the difference. And uh, so, yeah, short answer, measure first and measure early. Uh, <clears throat> large object hip compaction. So uh, yes, that's that's the very good thing is that, as I mentioned previously, GC has this decision pair. Every GC is a decision uh, whether we should sweep or compact. And I talk, uh, I talked about generations like here that we have three generations: Gen Zero, Gen One, Gen Two. Uh, another story is that another part of the managed heap is so-called large object heap. It is for objects that are bigger than 85,000 bytes. We can change this threshold, but that's the default. And big objects, because they are big, uh, we are afraid of moving them in memory. We are afraid of copying them. So large object heap by default is not compacted ever, uh, but it is only swept. And then we simply have um, hope that we will be re reusing the fragmentation in large object heap. But we have this flag, as Jose mentioned, that you can uh, have a single uh, compaction. Uh, you can compact once, so you can use these settings as presented on, this, on, the, on the screen, and then the next the full GC that will happen, the full GC is the GC that will just compact everything, uh, not compact, but it will uh, collect everything 
and because we have set this flag to compact once, it will also compact large object heap. When it is beneficial, if you see big fragmentation in large object heap and it is a problem for you. I have seen production applications when there was a gigabytes of large object heap and most of it was free space. So that was kind of a, let's say, not optimal memory usage because people were paying for three gigabytes of free space, for example. And uh, that probably one of the solutions would be to compact it uh, for one from time to time. Uh, another story is why, why we have this fragmentation. And uh, typically it is because, for example, we allocate a lot of arrays in large object heap, which are big, they are dying, but they we are allocating another ones. Somehow uh, they are in size that we are not able to reuse the free space. So in general, we have this fragmentation, at least maybe not always growing, but a lot of uh, free space that we are not reusing. Maybe we have allocated a lot of objects there, a lot of big arrays, and after uh, some after that, we don't need these arrays, we don't need uh, big arrays, but this memory will be steered there because I, as we said, large object heap is only swept by default. Uh, so this free space will be there. We will be having gigabytes of uh, free space and not returned to operating system because large object heap is not compacted by default. And uh, if it is a problem for you, and probably it may be like paying for gigabytes of memory, you will you can compact it a uh, single time with the help of this flag. So uh, this is exactly the scenario that you can use. Uh, Another question, can the preference of sweeping or compacting be set directly? <clears throat> so, um, that's a good question. In general, uh, the question is whether we control somehow the ratio between the compacting and sweeping, or maybe we could disable sweeping and compact always. So, um, not directly, at least there is no there not fully supported configuration flag that allows to compact always, but there is a flag that allows you to set the ratio between compacting and sweeping. And it is not fully supported, so I will not expect Microsoft will be super happy that you are using it because they are not guaranteeing anything regarding that. So, for example, maybe in future it will be not supported or not implemented. But there are some things that you can do. Or you can use tricks that make a GC more aggressive and it will be more willing to compact. For example, if you will set so-called hard limit on the memory usage on the process and you can do that. So you can say, for example, I don't want my process to make to take more memory than four gigabytes. It is so-called hard limit. And if application is seeing a hard limit, if GC is seeing hard limit, it will be more willing to compact. Moreover, since .NET 5, it will be more willing to compact large object heap 2, which is a new thing because that was uh, that's a, let's say, disclaimer that uh, I said large object heap is by default only sweeped, and that's true. But if we have this hard limit set, it will be sometimes compacted if we are getting close to the hard limit. So as you see, there are some various edge cases in which we have some control and we need to understand things simply to, um, have, to, to have some control over uh, all, all this magic that is happening underneath, which is in the end automatic, but we have some control. Okay, uh, I will just try to continue with the mind map because we are slowly ending the co covering it and I will return to questions if you don't mind. So uh, let's just give me the mind map. Th that was the generational thing. Maybe you don't feel it is fully covered, like Maoni for sure would be very happy to see that I'm covering generational aspects because it is pretty often ignored when talking about GC. And this thing about nepotism and the fact that the older GC 
these are no uh, not garbage collected by default not so often at least makes super important influence on your code like um, just to to make it clear again imagine that um, let's return to <clears throat> Let's return to, to the drawing to, uh, the, to the drawing and let's make it a little difference here. Imagine that you have this method which is pretty long and uh, let's say that it is uh, async method. Sorry for writing void async. it is anti-pattern but it's simpler simply. It is an async method and you have created this customer here. And now you are, for example, awaiting on await in super long operation. So we have this something which is pretty often probably meet. Uh, we have created an object and we are awaiting super long operation, which let's say take five minutes, uh, which is a lot of time in terms of CPU usage, for example. And the question is whether it makes sense to write something, uh, uh, this is null, we don't need it, assuming we really don't need it later on. So we can explicitly say, okay, I don't need this customer. I'm starting operation that takes five minutes. So I want to explicitly say, I don't need this customer. Maybe this customer takes one megabyte of memory, let's say. So I would like to reclaim this memory. I would like at least to have a chance to reclaim this memory by saying this is no longer needed. And in terms of C Sharp and in general in .NET, you have this possibility. You can simply null, nullify, null set no mm, sorry set null to this uh, local variable and then uh, as we said uh, tracing gc will discover okay this is no longer needed <clears throat> so uh, it will it may help like because we have set it to null here uh, it may help uh, the GC if it will happen somewhere during these five minutes. In the end, this variable will be null. So this will be whole object graph may be not used and will be discovered because of the tracing that it is not used. So we can reclaim memory. From that perspective, it may be beneficial. But this is, first of all, this is something that as always there are edge cases first of all this is happening uh, if you, this is happening automatically so dotnet runtime when it is uh, processing this method will discover when where this object is no longer needed and in the end it will simply inject this null automatically at the point when it is no longer needed so you don't need to uh, uh, say it explicitly because the runtime will discover that in the end on its own uh, so from this perspective uh, it doesn't make sense mm. but even if we do that even if we do if the runtime discovers that it may happen that the customer is, is here. So it, there may be our customer. And so even if we have this local variable pointing to this customer, which is somehow living in generation two, and when we dis set it to null, we will just dis uh, delete this reference. So it doesn't matter in the end probably because this comes customer is in generation two and it may happen that we will be just collecting generation zero and one and the dotnet gc will simply not look into the generation two so this customer may be living for a long time even it may uh, my outlife this operation because the gen 2 gc will simply not happen so uh, this generational aspect is really important. Even if we explicitly say something is null and there are no more references to an object, it doesn't really mean that it will be immediately uh, deleted because we need to trigger uh, GC for this particular generation to discover that fact. <laughs> so uh, remember about this generational aspect. That, that's something really important. 
Uh, and the very last thing, it may be concurrent. Like I will not cover it a lot here because uh, we are slowly over, we are already over one hour. So the thing is it may be concurrent, uh, which means uh, typically GC works all together with your application. You are doing your code, uh, your code is doing allocations and it, at the same time, the GC may be triggered and <clears throat> And uh, something will happen during the pause time, but then the work will be continued while your application is also working. And that's important because, again, uh, the, some inconsistencies will happen because you are allocating objects on one hand, you are changing references between objects on one hand on the other hand you are simply uh, trying to delete those objects so it is not trivial from the implementation point of view and it is super interesting to to understand even how it is implemented but uh, that's not the most important thing in course in case of dotnet but the, mo the more important thing is that uh, the concurrent gc in dotnet currently does not compact so we return to our important consequence of sweeping and compacting. If most of the GCs are not concurrent, if they will be not concurrent, it would be it would mean that typically we are compacting. But this is not the case. Uh, GC prefer to sweep because sweeping is much faster. And if it prefers sweeping, it means. Uh, I mean, it, if it, prefer, it prefers uh, concurrent, sorry, if it prefers concurrent GC, it means that it will be limited to, to sweeping. Uh, sweeping is fast, that's good, but it will also produce fragmentation. So in the end, our GC in .NET will be introducing some fragmentation because it is currently implemented as it. Okay, uh, but that probably maybe like mm, little less important thing like the generational aspect <clears throat> and uh, so we have those things and this is all let's say low let's say high point of view about various features and characteristics of the gc i will come to questions in a moment but another thing is that we have some problems because of that because obviously all this is interesting and i covered i hope at least covered some consequences that may directly uh, you know influence your work but we have some strict problems that can be um, that are results of it um, and during my everyday work, when I'm helping people to solve various GC related problems, I was thinking a lot of about that and I was trying to group those problems in so in some categories. And I ended in let's say eight categories of problems that may have yeah, that you may have because of those magic which is happening. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, what are those problems? First of all, I'm doing this in a form of the, uh, in a form of uh, ebook that will be available to download. So I'm writing it currently. It is top seven management mistakes in .NET. I'm doing this currently, and it should be available soon uh, for you. Uh, the top seven things that I not. I think they should be problem, but they are really problems from my experience when I'm working with customers uh, trying to solve various memory related things. When, when it will be available, where you can get it, I will just show you in a moment. Let's just uh, show you those problems itself. So the very first problem is the not understanding like that's the problem number zero i'm calling it problem number zero because it is common problem in various te technologies that we are using if you are using async await not understanding how it is really working may makes you troubles and you can write non-scalable programs that consume a lot of threads for example because you are trying to make 
asking away you are abusing asking away because you don't understand it so uh not understanding will be a problem just see misconfiguration another problem uh, if you don't understand the things that we have covered if you don't want know what are the gc modes that would be another thing uh, maybe you can change the gc and just get some uh, quick wins because you make it more aggressive for example uh memory leaks uh, is another thing like uh, the most surprising thing maybe for you uh, for me personally it is most surprising thing that most of the problems that i met with the gc is not related to code but to the how the gc is working and there are some let's say memory leaks because they are not really memory leaks but some problems with memory uh, due to strange behavior of the gc so, for example, you will see that there is no GC at all, and maybe you will treat it as a bug because GC will be not aggressive enough in reclaiming memory. Or maybe you will see your processes still with the same size, and then you will need to understand that that's because of fragmentation and, and not because of a bug in the GC. Uh, so the fragmentation will be another problem that you can meet sometimes. And the nepotism one, what I uh, describe you, uh, it may be surprising. You have a lot of old objects and constantly uh, promote some younger objects because they are so long living. Uh, memory leak may also happen typically because of events, because you are assigning something to a static field, which has the lifetime of the, the whole assembly uh, in which it is loaded. Uh, you can have a memory leak because of the assembly load context, which is currently in .NET unloadable, but it may produce a memory leak. Uh, so you can have some memory leaks just because you have some roots that are keeping your objects still alive, still reachable, and your object, your memory graph will be simply constantly growing. But you can have also memory leak uh, like the not real one because there are no Gen 2 GCs and your Gen 2 is growing simply because it is not triggered. The GC is not trying to uh, collect Gen 2, for example. Hide, hidden allocations, another story, pretty big one, like uh, you can allocate either, even not being aware of that. So you will have a lot of hidden allocations and uh, uh, one of the super typical and simple examples is boxing. So there are some scenarios in C-sharp when you are simply allocating things temporarily, even not necessarily, but because you have used some code and then you allocate and because you allocate you trigger more gc and by reducing those allocations which are even not necessary you will just put the less pressure on the gc which will be better for the cpu and for memory usage too cache cache is also a typical problem because cache is something that most GCs doesn't like because they are it is not let's say it is totally not the behavior expected by the generational GCs it is not the fact we have some objects that are long living but they then die and that's not the fact that uh, the GC would like to see because uh, the cache is dying in generation two for sure like if you have HTTP cache which caches something for half an hour um, the, there is a huge chance that those cache, uh, cached items will be promoted to generation two and they will be living there uh, for some time, it probably much longer than the cache itself. So the cache will clear those things, they will nullify those references that the cache is maintaining. But as we saw in case of the generational aspect, uh, those objects will be still there because the Gen 2, for example, will be not reclaimed. And in the end, the Generation 2 will gather a lot of garbage of cached items that are not longer cached because application doesn't have access to them, but they are still in memory. Uh, so cache is a problem. And unfortunately, even with a no good solution, uh, not at least not a super easy solution collections and my beloved linku is one of the problems like they try they, that's are super nice high level 
way of programming, but um, they like to allocate and introduce unnecessary allocations that I find pretty often a problem. Uh, if you are using them, for example, on hot paths, don't use them on hot paths. And uh, also the thing that we have, the, there are some questions about disposing and finalizing. So there is a lot of confusion of what it is, uh, what, they are, what they are for in the end. Uh, and they are not for reclaiming memory. As I mentioned, this pose is just a kind of a method that marks an object and you will know uh, that if it is uh, implementing iDisposable, you should call dispose on it and that's all. It is a contract simply. Uh, it doesn't have anything with the GC. In general, you probably should remember this rule of thumb that if your class does not have any unmanaged resources, you should not use dispose or finalize. They will not help you in reclaiming memory of this object. And um, a lot of more confusion comes from that fact. Uh, sometimes tr people tr think that dispose is somehow disposing memory after object. That's, that's not true. As I said, uh, <laughs> this is only short list. There's a kind of a, you know, spoiler how i see the most typical problems when you use dotnet and in bigger applications you will probably eventually meet one of those problems in your everyday programming if you are interested uh, about that <clears throat> and in general you would like to see this graphics and uh, uh, this mind map and also get the ebook that i showed you the ebook which was this top seven memory management mistakes in .NET, just go to the page, uh, which, is all about uh, which is all about memory management, which is here. So I will just show you the link now. And you can, uh, the best thing you can do now is just to uh, subscribe to this newsletter, which is there, because I'm giving their advices about .NET GC, uh, I will be giving there this mind map, I will give some slides and I will give some more knowledge about memory management. That's the, my, my main channel for you for informing you about memory management in .NET. So if you find it interesting, simply subscribe to this newsletter there and you will be informed about various activities, including course that I'm just opening very, very soon. So if you found it inter interesting, there will be also a, a training about that, that uh, you will be able to attend, which will cover, I believe, everything that you will be interested uh, regarding memory management. <clears throat> so just go there and, and subscribe simply or subscribe to our channel where I'm also presenting stuff about it. So I was, I'm not even sure if it is good introduction, uh, but I hope it gives you some overall view about the .NET GC and the main future features of it. Uh, mostly I would, what I would like to, to, to point is this generational aspect that it is a tracing GC, that it is a driven by a, your application behavior. So your code in the end, your allocations. There are many, many edge cases, obviously, like how you can fine tune things, how you can change the setting, um, which will make GC more aggressive or less. Uh, I will, Maybe I will show you a short demo, but first of all, I would like to return to questions and just not to leave you without answering them. So let's return to the chat and let's look at them. Uh, so I believe I've stopped at this question. So the next one is, um, uh, do you think that getting the details about GC, for example, from your book makes you a much better developer or it is more for somebody that would like to know more but not so much useful? So I believe it is super useful. I strongly believe that no, knowing this is important 
in your everyday programming like obviously uh, when we typically design our business domains when we design customers invoices and so other business related stuff this is not as important because gc is making a lot of super good job to make all this automatic so at the little let's say scale it doesn't matter so much but from my personal experience if only your application becomes a little bit bigger and it is really used by many people it has some all let's say constant um, load of customers you are processing some ca more customers than one per day then in the end you can land with those problems uh, that i'm pointing here and that's my personal experience so from even knowing about those problems it is super beneficial that's the story about let's say the program the application and company itself but personally i also believe it is worth to know it because you will be aware of that stuff and being aware of stuff makes you a better developer you will be able to solve some issues in your company you will be able to write um, simply avoid some stupid mistakes without even thinking uh, about uh, it a lot so absolutely absolutely yes uh, uh, about the thing that i've covered today uh, in much depth obviously about dotnet gc internals itself yes but even for bigger much like uh, bigger for more specific edge cases let's say so uh i personally obviously invite you to learn a lot also about internals but not everything needs to be known probably at the very beginning do not be overwhelmed with trying to deep dive into internals there is a lot of things to learn even at the level that i presented you today so for the, for that for sure it is it will make you much better developer in the end uh okay next question uh, pros and cons about gc and uh, the other techniques like reference counting and resource acquisition is initialization technique so uh yes as al as always we have some pros and pros and cons as as jose mentioned so for sure the main benefit of the garbage collection as i presented which is the tracing gc is it uh, easy it provides super um, super pleasant api for the for the for the developer so you only allocate an object and you really don't need to think about anything else uh, it will just be somehow deleted afterwards when it is no longer needed period and that's that super nice thing uh, all because for example you don't need to think about cycle references they are handed out of the box uh, you don't need to make any magic you don't need to mark anything to say here i'm having a cycle reference or so they are just handled out of the box the cons is there is some overhead uh, because as you as you as i was describing uh, it is non-deterministic it will be reclaimed not immediately but only after some time we will discover that it is no longer needed so from this perspective it adds some overhead on the other hand we have those other techniques which are pretty deterministic so typically as soon as we detect it something is no longer needed we can get rid of it immediately which makes aggressive reclamation because that's super nice that for example the counter showing that we have no references to an object drops to zero that means we can get rid of this object so it's nice it also produces incremental work because it, we can constantly discover those things we don't need to make anything like gc uh, stop the world look around in the object graph because reference counting may discover those things all the time so it will be incremental work 
which is spread around the whole application lifetime. So th that would be a benefit, for example. But on the other hand, then when we have a problem with the cycle references, because it is not uh, easily handled by by reference counting. Our resource acquisition is initialization is just a technique that the programmer needs to be aware of. It needs to make it make usage of it. May it needs to rethink about how to <coughs> code to make this resource uh, fit into this technique. So it puts some uh, burden, let's say, on the developer itself. In case of the tracing DC, you only allocate objects and you don't care. And that's the, the main benefit. <coughs> OK. Mm. The next question is, can we change the threshold uh, of the large object heap? And yes, we can. There is this large object heap threshold uh, parameter that you can change by, for example, environment variable. And it can be increased. You cannot decrease it. You can only increase it. So you can say, for example, that it's one terabyte. <laughs> and in the end, it will make all your objects being allocated in Gen 0 and uh, living in small object heap, because probably you will not allocate object bigger than one ter terabyte. But you can always measure whether it is beneficial for or not. There is no single person in the on this planet that will uh, sh say that for sure you should do it. The only thing you, you can do is to measure the change like before and after and what the value will be good for you. Typically, people are not changing that because they are not aware of that. Uh, it, it may help in some scenarios. So that can be changed, yeah. Uh, the question, next question, how we can measure our application memory behavior? Should we be a developer on production and how tools, metrics, what do you recommend? So that's huge topic in my course that I'm working on currently, it is one week of uh, describing various tools that you can use for measuring exactly that. What good about it is that most of those tools is production ready. So you can without, typically even without a big overhead, you can measure things even on production. Um, for example, there is this, that, uh, the whole suite of tools, uh, which is called, uh, let me just open the browser here which is called uh, .NET CLI Diagnostic Tool. And from here, you can start to, to look at the .NET memory usage, and not only the .NET memory usage, but including it. So the current, the, the current tool of choice is .NET Diagnostic Tools CLI a suite of tools, uh, which will show you without overhead, for example, the heap size, the number of the generate, the sizes of generations, how often GCs happen for every generation and uh, other stuff. So I'm a little afraid of even starting covering all that, but start from there if you are interested uh, in monitoring. Most of those tools are production friendly. That's good. Obviously, there are also commercial tools like uh, APMs, like Dynatrace or AppDynamics that plug in you to your application, and then you can uh, see all those measurements also presented nicely there. But that's pretty obvious. Like if you are paying for powerful tool, they will make powerful thing for you. But uh, a lot of tools are also available for free. Uh, please give us some more stories about memory allocation. Some things and anomalies that you notice in the apps on production, how you tracked it down. That's super nice topic for more, even yet another, <laughs> yet another webinar. And because this one is even longer than I was planning to, I will postpone answer to this to the next webinar, which probably will be next week. And I will present there some use some examples of, of interesting things that may happen in memory, for example, because of allocations. So stay tuned. Next week, 
um, I will present some examples and uh, just be there. Okay. Uh, next question, <clears throat> off topic question. What language would you recommend learning, C++ or Rust? Mm, Rust, like uh, if you don't both of them and uh, you don't have any particular reason of learning one of another, start from Rust because it is more NOAA day driven. Uh, it is much more, let's say, like it is pretty innovative in terms of memory usage or memory management too. Uh, it is really worth to know it. Like C, C++ typically probably is a, you will always have time for learning them. Rust is pretty new thing uh, in terms of how it manages memory and other stuff, how the concept of uh, ownership and borrowing and other stuff is really fun to learn. So I definitely uh, would choose Rust to, to at least have some grasp, initial grasp, grasp, grasp at, at it. Uh, Jose. <clears throat> Defragment, is there a method to defragment the heap uh, memory? Mm. No, like we can compact, like even you have shown as the flag for com forcing to compact large object heap, we can force to compact the small object heap, uh, but we cannot defragment it, you know, meaning of defragmenting uh, the hard disks. So we cannot move things around to make it somehow more efficient in terms of memory access, because the GC is pretty not aware of how they should lie in memory to make it efficient. So it could probably, but I'm not aware of any GC in the world which is trying to do that uh, in defragmenting in that way we can compact getting rid of free space which is kind of at least way let's say defragmenting technique also but not exactly the probably the the one that you were thinking about <clears throat> uh, this will be only one time introduction a webinar yes it is but if you are interested in general in various performance related topics just you can subscribe to our channel and i am giving here various webinars about memory and performance and other guys folks and so on so uh, this is not a series that was just one shot uh, one time shot uh, webinar about that and we will see what the future will bring uh, but I don't plan to, to, to make it a series. Uh, okay. The next thing is... Um, yes, I, I, during our .NET OS conference, it was usually last week or two weeks ago, uh, I mentioned there is a implementation of the .NET GC that is uh, created by me because in .NET GC you can re in .NET you can replace the GC, and uh, I've done it. And there is .NET GC written by me, which is not reclaiming memory. That's why it is called zero GC because it is only allocating and. It is available on GitHub, so you can find it under the name Epsilon GC. I will try to find the link Epsilon GC. Uh, yeah, here it is. So here's the link. Uh, you can decompile it. It is C++ library. You can plug it into the runtime and maybe it will not explode <laughs> it will be it was created at the time of the runtime 3.1 as far as i remember uh, so probably it should run on it and uh, it will simply make your application a huge memory leak because it only <laughs> allocates object uh, objects and do not reclaim them like, like it is a starting point for writing something more sophisticated <laughs> Uh, okay. <clears throat> uh, 
so uh, the very last question probably we should also slowly end because uh, it is half an hour above the time uh, retain VM hmm. there is such a flag uh, which is pretty deep dive like <laughs> I was trying to avoid deep dive things, but yes, there. if you are asking, there is this flag which is called Retain uh, Virtual Memory. Uh, that's for the behavior which touches how in general .NET talks with the operating system when it is when it is uh, asking for memory and it is based on so-called segments. So when the for example, imagine there is a segment for generation two and uh, all objects in generation two are in this particular segment. This segment is called, it, it is a continuous memory region and it may happen that uh, the GC happens. It is a GC, then two GC, so it will reclaim memory from the generation two and it may happen that all those objects will be deleted. So in the end, we will uh, have a segment that is empty because we have no objects in generation two afterwards. Uh, so um, now two things we can do. We can just return this segment to operating system, which is nice because we will return a lot of memory probably, and the memory usage of the process will drop. Or we can retain this segment to be reused in future because we expect that if we have such memory usage uh, probably in future also we will create some objects that will be create uh, promoted to generation two so we will be in need for a space for this generation two so we will probably need to create a segment so instead of deleting this segment and returning it to the operating system and later on asking operating system to give us a new segment uh, and to, to get rid of this dance with the operating system, we can set this flag to true and uh, we will just retain this segment is in a kind of standby list. So it will be reused uh, when we will be in the need of having a segment. So that's uh, the whole story about the retain VM, which is again uh, one of the flags that controls the aggressiveness of the GC, because as you see, uh, it may return something to the operating system. So the memory will be drop uh, in uh, the process will shrink in terms of memory uh, usage or not return and the memory will stay even after the GC that reclaimed a lot of objects. So your millage may vary. By default, when you host ASP.NET applications, they have this flag enabled. Uh, so those segments are retained and are constantly reused. <clears throat> uh, okay, let's slowly end and uh, having, let's say, the very last questions. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Major differences or advancements between .NET and .NET Core? Pretty big question, I believe. Uh, we could start a long webinar here, especially with Bartek, which just has showed up on, to, <laughs> on chat also. What are the differences between uh, what, uh, with the .NET and .NET Framework and .NET Core. In terms of the GC, which is the topic of our webinar today, those are not so big currently. Um, they are mostly backported between the .NET Core and .NET Framework. So if, even if there was some improvement in .NET Core, uh, they, they were moved to .NET Framework. But this difference is slowly bigger and bigger, and the gap is widening because simply um, .NET Framework is not yet not no longer supported officially. Let's say at, at least in terms of uh, new features. So I'm trying to give you a, some an example that will directly touch the memory management difference between those two runtimes. Mm. 
but I'm not aware of any. That's that's a good question. Uh, that's a good question that will probably will be covered in one of the newsletter uh, uh, editions because uh, I need to think. So, Mohammed, thank you for an interesting question. Like, I'm I having in mind some small differences, but nothing super big that would make a huge difference. <clears throat> So not to, maybe I will not keep you online while I'm trying to think. I will try to answer it later on uh, in somewhere. Uh, okay, another thing. Yeah, differences between various GCs. Uh, I'm having that in mind. I obviously have, I have a mind map already for that, <laughs> like the difference between various GCs. And that this maybe just describing this mind map would be an interesting webinar. So stay tuned. Maybe I will just make it uh, sometime um, because that's that's interesting topic for for sure. Uh, event uh, another event scheduled. It will be scheduled uh, next week because of the .NET Memory Expert, which will be also kicked off. So uh, there will be another uh, event and for sure even more later on. So simply expect seeing me more and more <laughs> on YouTube and in various places. Um, okay. It's more than half an hour more longer than I was planning to. So probably we should slowly end. Thank you very much for being with me uh, as if you have any more questions, do not hesitate to ask here on YouTube as a comment or simply on Twitter or maybe at uh, this. You can contact us via subscription and the newsletter that I'm showing you. So you have various possibilities to catch me and ask questions. Just do not hesitate to do that. I'm super. I hope you have learned something. I'm not sure it was, uh, you know, well structured enough for you, but I hope you have some more knowledge about the .NET GC and uh, some bi bigger understanding about the most important aspects of it, at least. So thank you very much. Uh, have a nice day wherever you are, whether it is morning, evening, or maybe you are preparing dinner. Have a nice day, have a nice evening and see you somewhere. Stay tuned for the information about the webinar in the next week. It will be also on Monday. So you can book your time next Monday evening, even now. Just remember about that. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Bye. And I am clicking and broadcast. <laughs>